Okay. All right. Uh, let's start. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be here today. Talk about swallowing disorders and myotonic uh, muscular dystrophy. Um, and um, I have a few questions that people have submitted, but uh, hopefully as we go through this, there will be more that will come in, but I'll try to answer some of these as we go through uh, some of the slides in the uh, presentation. So let me just start with the term uh, dysphagia, note the spelling, D-Y-S-P-H-A-G-I-A. If you put an S-I-A in there, it's a whole different disorder that has to do with a communication problem from stroke. But <clears throat> most people pronounce it dysphagia. Sometimes you hear dysphagia, but both are uh, totally uh, acceptable. But it's the medical term for what we refer to as swallowing problem. Um, two of the main hallmarks of the definition that fit the definition are these two things on this slide. And one is delay uh, and or, and frequently they are tied together, or misdirection. And <clears throat> what I mean by that is that a lot of times when it takes too long to swallow, so something goes into your mouth and takes too long to get to the back of your throat and it stays there too long, it may get or has a greater chance to be misdirected, uh, for instance, into the airway or the trachea and then go down into the lung field, which is, of course, what we want to avoid. The other thing that sort of fits misdirection is that sometimes we can get food from the mouth to the back of the throat, into the esophageal tube, but it doesn't go down that tube and it may come back up. So it gets misdirected back up into the back of the throat and may become a problem. Now, it's an interesting question that we always ask, when is dysphagia actually dysphagia? I.e., there are people that probably have problems with swallow delay, let's say, but can we really say that that fits the term uh, dysphagia? All of us have had episodes at time of what you might say is a misdirection, for instance, coughing while we're eating, and usually that happens in the circumstance of when we're trying to talk and we're eating at the same time. Is that dysphagia? Well, maybe not, but for me, I think it, the definition comes clear most of the time when we find out that it really becomes a concern when it interferes either with our health. So for instance, um, if something continually gets misdirected down into the airway, uh, we call that aspiration and that might turn into a pneumonia. And so that would interfere certainly with health and or interference with your quality of life. So when you start to say to yourself, this swallowing problem that I perceive is really changed, I'm not going out to eat anymore, I'm eating food that I don't like to eat, uh, eating is not enjoyable anymore. So that's when we start to think that this delay and misdirection are really part of this syndrome that we call dysphagia. Now, some of the signs or the things that we see on physical evaluation or the, or the symptoms that you might be complaining about, what, what sort of sets up the definition of, of dysphagia. And, and obviously, on the top of the list, one is an excessive amount of coughing during the meal. And that's probably a sign that things obviously are going the wrong way. They're going down into the laryngeal region, probably to the level of the vocal cords, and that triggers a cough during the meal. And actually, um, while it's irritating, having a cough reflux is a good sign. It's a thing that says basically we're able to by moving our vocal folds, keep things from entering, uh, going below the vocal cords down into the lung fields. 
Um, excessive coughing at night that awakens you, and this is a sort of a common problem because when we're in a lying down position, it's not necessarily the best position that we can be in to protect our airway. And um, some of you, one of the questions my, I might handle at this time is that is that um, one of the questions was that that um, uh, uh, someone mentioned that they were waking up coughing on their saliva, and it, the truth of the matter is, it's interesting that that there's evidence that about 30% of us actually. Um, have our saliva drain into our lungs at night actually without coughing. Um, but the idea that um, saliva, of course, when you cough on it at night, um, it wakes you up. And, you know, how might you avoid that was one of the questions. And, and of course, one of the more obvious things is that you have to, while it's uncomfortable, I understand that, you have to sort of prop your head up into a more upright position, which tends to anatomically protect your airway better. Um, about <clears throat> 10 years ago, there was a physician in the Seattle area who managed patients with progressive Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, who also who complain a lot of difficulty managing saliva at night, and his recommendation was to give a low dose of a antidepressant uh, before bedtime, which the side effect of an antidepressant often is to dry out the oral cavity. And so uh, some patients got relief from that. But of course, that would be something that you would want to discuss with your physician. Uh, taking longer times to finish a meal is usually uh, consistent with uh, some problem with uh, swallowing, and I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Unintended weight loss, people who lose weight oftentimes are not getting enough nutrients during their meal, primarily because of the dysphagic condition, perhaps. But weight loss is a big issue because um, it can lead to diminution of other muscle mass and lead to weakness, and that all can affect not only our ambulation and our walking, but also our ability to swallow. Um, as you have a swallowing problem, people will typically complain that they're, they can tell you that they're avoiding certain liquids or liquids in general or certain foods foods that are hard to chew, foods that are dry, foods that crumble are frequent complaints that we might get that are consistent with signs and symptoms of a swallowing problem. Nasal regurgitation is a problem where that some may have experienced where actually, um, usually liquids, actually come back from the back of the throat and go into the nasal cavity. And it's not really a problem um, that's usually secondary to a weakness in the back of the throat, but it's usually a problem that is from an inability to open the top of the esophagus. So the food gets to that level and, it, and the esophagus doesn't open and it comes back up and we call that nasal regurgitation. Heartburn we'll deal with a little bit later, but this is um, a frequent problem just in the population in general where we have um, the acid taste or we have pain in our chest. And this can be an accompaniment of MD because the esophagus isn't actually working like it should. Then there's a common complaint that things feel like they're getting stuck. Um, usually this is a problem with solids or semi-solids. Uh, patients often localize it to, the, to their neck region or sometimes to the mid-chest region, and this is usually consistent with a problem um, of dysphagia. Um, specific to muscular dystrophy and swallowing, uh, some of the things that the literature suggests is that the 
problems that we see are really secondary to weakness in the muscles uh, for swallow, stiffness in all of the muscles that we use uh, to swallow, and including, and we'll talk about these stages in just a minute. So the oral stage, the pharyngeal stage, and the esophageal muscles. One of the biggest problems in MD is that when these muscles contract, which they have to do to swallow normally, that there's a slowness and relaxation of that contraction, which is going to probably interfere with the next contraction and make that next contraction less efficient. So this is sort of the, the, the description of how the muscles work in, in MD. Um, that failure to contract a lot of times results in the fatigue. Um, and some of the things that have been noticed in the literature, particularly as it relates to the third stage, the esophageal stage, is that eating things with, that are cold actually makes the delay in those contractions, particularly in the esophagus, longer than we normally see. Um, the oral stage, um, the characterization in MD is that there's difficulty in chewing. Bolus just means basically that's what we refer to when we're talking about what we're swallowing, basically. So when I say bolus, I'm either talking about a liquid or a semi-solid or a solid. And because there is some weakness in the oral stage, it's hard to sort of control that bolus. And we'll talk about that in just a second. In the second stage, in the, in, when it gets to the back of the throat, the pharyngeal stage, the problems tend to be with choking on things and or failure of that upper muscle that goes into the esophagus to actually open. And I'll talk about why that might be. It's actually related to a problem in the oral stage. In the final stage, and when it gets into the esophagus, um, again, we can have patients complain about things that sort of stick, and then there might be the complaint of heartburn, uh, either associated with the meal, but usually it's associated after the meal, maybe two to three hours later, where there's pain in the chest, and um, that, uh, as we'll talk about later, uh, has to be managed appropriately. So. Let me just stop here at this point, Leslie. I think there were uh, a couple of questions that I had about people in terms of how they uh, might have or what their complaints are before, or was it a swallowing problem uh, as part of their diagnosis of MD, or has this problem uh, with swallowing come after they've had this so, disease? So I'll launch the poll. OK, that would be great. Okay. And here are the results. Mm -hmm. So oh. it's 38% um, before DM diagnosis and 62% oh. after DM diagnosis. Okay, that's that's interesting to me. I sometimes um, that can be the you know, in 38% of the people who are online, they that actually might have led to the diagnosis because of probably weakness in muscles, but usually. And this poll, I think, um, it actually confirms it that usually after diagnosis, the majority have begin as the disease might be progressing to have the swallowing problems. But I appreciate the the feedback on that because there's really scant information about that in the literature. So that's why we sort of included that. So thank you, everyone. For You're welcome. Are you? Would you like me to launch the second poll about? Oh uh, yeah. Okay, and the results are 64% have modified their diet and 36% haven't. Okay, all right, excellent information for me. Um, yeah, diet uh, modification is a, is a common intervention, and it would be suggested by this group that that uh, a, a preponderance of, of respondents have been have done that, but it's nice also that there's a fairly large number of people who haven't had to do that. So that's encouraging to me. So let me move on and, and just talk about um, 
normal swallow because understanding this helps us understand, I think, a little bit or gives you some insight in your own problem. Um, this slide with the three circles sort of uh, says a lot of things. First of all, it, it talks about just how swallowing is divided into the classical three stages. So the beginning stage in the mouth, oral phase, second stage, back of the throat, basically, pharyngeal phase, and then the third phase, the esophagus. And then, you know, finally everything goes through the esophagus and goes down into the stomach. One of the key things about this slide, though, is that notice that the circles overlap. And basically that's telling us that we can't really look at these stages as independent, but they're interdependent. So things that are abnormal maybe in the oral stage can affect the pharyngeal stage, can affect the esophageal phase. Problems in the esophagus going the other way can affect what goes on in the pharynx and even in some cases in the oral phase. The bottom line is that if in, in MD we know that there's the potential that each one of these phases can be involved. And so a really a complete swallowing evaluation, even though some of them may just focus on the mouth and the back of the throat, also ought to include the esophagus. And I'll say a little bit more about that later, but, but I think it's important for you to realize that all three of these stages are at risk in these disease and that one may uh, affect the other and so that you can have a primary problem let's just say in the esophageal stage that its impact is felt in the pharynx or in the mouth so first stage you can see here voluntary it's the one that we can control the most and therefore as rehabilitation specialists we can do things about it we can change the way, the number of times we chew. We can place things in various areas in the mouth to improve swallow, etc. cetera. Um, probably the second phase where you see on the left-hand side here the reflex when we get to the back of the throat. Once it sort of gets to that stage, there's little that we can do to control it. And then finally, when it goes down to the esophagus, uh, that's pretty much involuntary. But let's focus a little bit on the voluntary stage. Once you put that bolus into your mouth, it's pretty much a reflex. Let, let's just say that it's a chewable, that all of a sudden we start this, this feedback loop of our jaw starts moving and our tongue starts moving the bolus back and forth on the teeth as, as we chew. And as the jaw sort of moves up and down, it basically makes saliva. And saliva is an important component in, in facilitating swallow. It facilitates taste. And um, it's a, uh, in also an important ingredient to sort of keep the acidity down uh, in, our, in our stomach. Um, so you can uh, sort of you know, uh, understand the importance of saliva. If you just try to, you know, I bet you that you, it's very difficult for you to just swallow your saliva three times in a row um, uh, because basically without it, it's very hard to sort of trigger uh, a swallow reflux. So it's an important component in this, in this oral stage. Now, the tongue also is probably the most important player here. And I realize that tongue weakness is something that's been described uh, extensively in, in MD. Um, and so that it's, and we'll talk on the next slide about the importance of the tongue in, in the next stage of swallow. But preparing the bolus and getting it ready to swallow, basically as we get it ready to swallow, the tongue has to move up to the roof of the mouth. And that sort of builds up a positive pressure that we need to sort of send the bolus on its way to the back of the throat. And so if you're unable to really build up that positive pressure, 
it may cause delay. And if you remember in our first slide, delay is one of the hallmarks and one of the things that we try to avoid in swallowing problems because delay leads oftentimes to misdirection. Now another important component to keeping the pressure high in the oral cavity right at the moment of swallow is that the lips have to stay together when we swallow. And lip weakness has been described in MD. And if there's one of the basic treatment recommendations that I can tie in at this point in time, it would be to make sure that just at the moment of swallow that you make every effort that you can to keep your lips together. Because you, if you don't, you lose the high pressure that you're generating in the oral stage and that will slow down the movement of the bolus from the mouth to the back of the throat. And you can demonstrate that to yourself. Just go ahead, make a swallow, swallow your saliva. Now try to swallow your saliva with your lips open. And you'll see immediately there's an increased effort in doing that. And so concentrating on lip closure is a really important part of having a, a safe swallow because that um, it, it's an important um, thing to keep that pressure high to move the bolus from the front to the back. Now, this is a picture of looking at the jaw here, the arrow from the side, and we're looking at some of the muscles underneath the jaw which connect to the tongue. Look at my arrow. And then we go farther down to this bone that's sort of underneath your chin called the hyoid bone. And one of the important things about tongue weakness and the hyoid bone, all the tongue muscles are connected to this bone. So that when you start to swallow, you pull this bone up and forward. And notice that these muscles underneath the bone, those are going to be connected to the top of your esophagus. So that if your tongue is weak and doesn't pull this bone up, it's going to have problems opening the top of the esophagus. And when material hangs around on the top of the esophagus too long, it can fall into the airway and cause choking. So tongue weakness not only interferes with moving the food in the oral cavity, but it also might interfere with opening the top of the esophagus. And that's an important point to kind of keep in mind or one to explain your swallowing problem. Okay, so this slide is, gets us into the second stage, the pharyngeal stage. And just look at this one um, for a moment. And here's bolus. So you can see that it's into the back of the throat. This is the soft palate up here, which is closed off so that we keep things out of the nasal cavity. And this yellow tube goes down is the airway and goes down to the lungs. But of course, we want food to go through this way into the esophagus. So when the food is in the back of the throat, this piece right here is the epiglottis. And one of you asked the question about if food sort of hangs up or is on the top of my epiglottis, is that a big problem? And basically, if we go over to looking at the swallow from the from the front. So here's the epiglottis. This black part is the entrance to the airway. And pretty much I would say uh, to the person who had asked that question is that that's not really a threat to the airway as much as if material sort of hangs around these two little spaces on the side of the epiglottis called the vollecula. Now if food builds up here too much, it could spill over into the airway. But it's not so much an issue of things being on the top of the epiglottis as it is in the space behind the epiglottis. That's an issue here. Now, one of the important things that happens in this stage when the bolus gets to the back of the throat is that we stop breathing. So that's a protective mechanism of the airway. And a lot of times in, in more advanced MD, people have respiratory impairment. And it's hard to stop breathing during swallow events. And one of the things that can uh, be useful in treatment is 
because we know the larger the amount of the bolus, the longer the airway stays closed. So if you have a breathing problem with your MD, it's probably going to be best in treatment to swallow things that are smaller in size because we don't have to have the airway stay closed for a long period of time in order to successfully swallow and protect the airway. The final stage of swallowing is the esophageal stage. And what we have here is a picture of the esophagus. And it's made up of two different kinds of muscle. Both of these types of muscles can be affected in, in MD. But once the material gets into the esophagus, it goes through this muscle at the top of the esophagus called the upper esophageal sphincter. And that Remember, it has to, basically that muscle has to relax neurologically, then it's pulled open by your tongue, pulling up that hyoid bone. And then it sort of goes into the esophagus and it wiggles down by the process called peristalsis, and it goes down to the bottom part here, to the lower esophageal sphincter, which has to relax, and finally the material goes into the esophagus. So those basically, in a nutshell, are the three stages of, of swallow and how they work normally. So how do we evaluate this problem? Well, you're going to request one through your primary care doc. And um, if he suspects a problem in usually the oral or pharyngeal stages, he'll refer to you to a speech language pathologist such as myself. If by your complaint, and usually I would say that if you're complaining of solid food sticking in your chest region, they're probably going to localize that to the esophagus and refer you to the specialist called gastroenterologist. Um, I would say my advice is that if, if they might be unsure, I would start with the evaluation by the speech language pathologist who would then determine if you needed to go on and see another uh, specialist. Um, speech language pathologist will take complete history of your swallowing problem, look at all of the muscles, clinical evaluation, and probably schedule you for what's called a video fluoroscopic swallowing study, um, or you'll hear the term modified barium swallow. This is just basically looking at you swallowing um, while you're upright, um, and it 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 uh, takes a dynamic picture of your oral, pharyngeal, and upper part of the esophagus. Chances are they'll hopefully use both liquids and solids. They'll add barium, which allows them to see that on the x-ray. Uh, some use barium only, and you're in the seated position. Now, my recommendation is that if you're able to stand, that, that the speech pathologist actually has you stand up for this test and you can actually move the um, the radiographic machine that looks at your swallow all the way from the top down to the top of your stomach and you can at least screen your esophagus to look for any delays or problems that might be in the esophageal stage. Sometimes the recommendation is to do what's called swallow endoscopy which basically is is um, it can be done by a speech language pathologist or an ear, nose, and throat doctor. It's placing a tube through your nose and actually looking at the structures in the back of your throat, focusing on your vocal fold movement and the constriction of your pharyngeal muscles. So both swallow endoscopy and video fluoroscopy are the two studies that are used to evaluate that. So what do we do for a better swallow? Well. Um, Multiple small meals, very important to avoid the fatigue factor. So, because fatigue basically leads to increased respiratory rates a lot of times, and that leads to poor airway protection. Um, alternating solid foods with liquid to avoid food buildup. We talked a little bit about how residue might build up because of weakness, either in the mouth, more commonly in the back of the throat, so the alternating of solids and liquids can help avoid buildup, which might spill into the airway. So that's why we make that recommendation. Um, taking your time, 
is important um, because there's a couple of things. Making multiple swallow attempts, remember in the very beginning, I talked about the fact that contractions happen and, and the relaxations take a longer time in this disease. So giving yourself ample time between swallows might help alleviate some problems because when you feel something in the back of your throat, you tend to want to swallow multiple times, but sometimes that can be interfering. So smaller bites, single swallows may be very useful. We also know that, that when you make multiple swallow attempts because things are sort of stuck in your throat, that that, if, that interferes with the esophageal stage and its peristaltic movement. So smaller amounts, single swallows might, might be very useful. So I mentioned earlier smaller bolus sizes, especially when they're breathing uh, difficulties because um, the airway doesn't have to stay closed as long um, when, you, when you swallow a smaller bolus. Uh, finally, avoid colder food items. Earlier I mentioned the fact that there's good evidence that that interferes with the movement of the esophagus, and and so um, that uh, is a, a recommendation that we frequently make. Um, these are specific suggestions for some. Um, chin down posture, and notice I underline may help protect the airway. It tends to uh, anatomically cover the entrance to your airway, and it may be appropriate for some. Uh, what speech language pathologists call the supraglottic swallow is basically when you get ready to swallow, make sure you're holding your breath through the whole sequence before you breathe again. Um, again, I would recommend that if you're uh, thinking about that they may be appropriate for you, that you validate it on a video for a graphic study um, by a speech language pathologist. Um, important to remain upright for two hours after your meal um, to avoid any complications from things coming back up on you, reflux and heartburn, because sometimes we can choke on things that we swallow, but we can also choke on things after we finish the meal, i.e. they come back up into the esophagus and enter the back of your throat and can be very damaging to the lungs. Um, if you complain of or have heartburn, uh, it's important that you ask your primary care doc to consult a gastroenterologist who usually can manage that, not in all cases, but, but with medication. Um, now, it's important to, to mention when, when safe swallowing, i.e. stuff goes into your airway and creates multiple aspiration pneumonias and hospitalizations, it might be appropriate that, that oral feeding is not um, uh, appropriate and so uh, feeding tubes. Um, it's, it's important to remember, and some people don't know this, that you can have a feeding tube placed in your stomach but still eat some things orally, things that the speech pathologists have deemed safe for instance. So it doesn't preclude you eating things. It just makes it maybe easier to get sufficient calories so you can keep your weight up. Um, tube feeding only, placement of a feeding tube usually these days is done by a gastroenterologist. They don't need to do it under general anesthesia now, which can be a threat. Um, you're just sort of put out and a little bit woozy. Um, and then it's important to always be followed up for your feeding tube and what goes through that tube. Uh, and I would recommend consultation uh, by a dietitian. Um, these are some things, just treatment-oriented websites um, that um, I have, let me just say, I have no um, financial interest in any of these uh, places or companies. But I would, you know, if you're interested in reading more about diets, um, if you go on the website of the American Speech Language Hearing Association, just Google that, and um, they have a lot of stuff there about diets that are recommended for various disorders. Um, Hormel bought out a company called Cliffdale Farms about eight years ago, um, and 
I am familiar with their diets. I put pureed in parentheses. They're soft diets that don't necessarily look appetizing, but the flavor and the nutrient value is, is outstanding. Um, they have things like broccoli and cheese souffle, uh, peanut butter sandwich, and when you eat these, it, it's exactly like the description. So um, that, and they, I think they uh, deliver to the home, so you might be interested in, in those uh, food items. The other thing, if you're interested in specific techniques, if you Google swallowing disorder techniques, there's not a lot of video that actually demonstrate things, but the general descriptions of the approaches are there, and it's pretty easy to follow. But again, you want to get guidance from your health care provider on whether or not those treatments, such as you know, the chin down posture or supraglottic swallow is really um, appropriate for you. So let me end there and ask you, Leslie, if we have any questions that we can deal yes, with. We, yes, we do. That was wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. So sure. um, do frequent, almost daily hiccups have any correlation with dysphagia? Sometimes they do. Um, um, not all times, but um, it may be an indication a lot of times when we when we have that as a disorder, there's a a lot of diagnostic things that a physician will go through to figure it out. One might be associated with a swallowing problem, i.e. something usually in the esophagus or an irritation of a, of a nerve in the back of the throat. But um, it's, it's a hard um, symptom to sort of sort out. And they go through various things, all the way from nerve irritation to blockages in the swallowing passages. So, um, you know, both of those things are, are, are something that need to be sorted out. Okay, and here's a question. Do you have any experience with vital stimulation treatment? And if so, uh, what are your thoughts as possible treatment for mu muscle weakness to help improve swallowing? Well, the the um, vital stim or, or electrical stimulation to the muscles have been not ex extensively, in my opinion, evaluated in a reasonable way in the literature in terms of, you know, having a specific group for whom it might be applied. There's one small study that looked at electrical stimulation in stroke, post-stroke patients. And it showed pretty successfully that stimulating the muscles electrically post-stroke was an effective treatment in patients who had dysphagia, chronic dysphagia. So I'm a little bit hesitant to say, because it hasn't been done in patients with MD, that that would be appropriate as, in terms of a intervention. It just has not been tested. So I'm hesitant to say that that would be an appropriate intervention, you know, at this point in time. But there is some evidence that, it, that, it, that it's appropriate in, in stroke patients and other patients with neurologic disease, but not progressive neurologic disease. Okay. And uh, someone is talking about their 13-year-old daughter who has DM1, and she has tongue thrust any recommendation oh yeah sorry I didn't yeah I saw that um, the um, tongue when we mentioned that the tongue pushes things back normally and uh, there's two thoughts about tongue thrust for me first that maybe it's I'm, I'm not sure if it's might not be something that's always been present but perhaps not in other words it's usually something that is a problem that we see in children in the you know six to eight year um, age group uh, that doesn't necessarily interfere with swallow, um, but in some cases, if it's severe enough, it might you know, actually push the bolus back out of the mouth. The second thing that I would say, if it's something that is acquired over a period of time, is that.
it might be the result of jaw weakness. That is, the jaw does not stabilize itself enough to let the tongue do the work of swallow, meaning from the front to the back rather than the back to the front. And so um, jaw weakness may uh, interfere or actually precipitate uh, tongue thrusting. But it, it's not a, a common problem in, in uh, MD. So here's another question. You know these are all over the map, so <laughs> jumping around. Uh, you had mentioned to avoid colder items. What about hot liquids? Would they help move things along? I don't know that they would necessarily. I don't know, and I say that because I don't have any experimental evidence to suggest that it would. Um, um, my thought would be that the issue is more, you know, is that, you know, try it out. Does it seem to interfere? I doubt that it would. All the evidence that I know about is the cold, and it's mostly focused on the esophageal stage. But I don't. Nobody's really looked at temperature to facilitate swallow at this point in time. What do you suggest if you still have all of the symptoms of dysphagia and yet your modified barium swallow results come back normal? Um, I guess th in terms of, well, um, I'm, I'm assuming that, 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 that who's asking this question is probably maybe on a regular diet. Um, sometimes when a swallowing study comes back as quote unquote normal, there may be differences in normality. And what I mean by that is that Sometimes we can read a swallowing study as being within the normal range, but there are certain things about it that put somebody at risk for abnormality. And so what I do is I counsel somebody about what those risk factors might be. So for instance, if I see a buildup of residue in that swallowing study, which really doesn't interfere or make it totally abnormal, I'll just counsel that patient and say, you know, you have a chance of residue building up in some cases, alternate liquids and semi-solids, et cetera. So um, if, if you can talk to the person that did that study and get that information from them about what things, even though it was abnormal, was there anything that suggested I may be at risk for a problem? That would be the question that I would ask and then go from there. Um, obviously, if, if symptoms um, uh, develop beyond um, what they are now, you would want to get a repeat study. So I have one final question for you. Yep. Yep. Um, this person tends to have a choking sensation when she turns her head to one side while swallowing. Is this yeah. common among others? Is it, I'll say again, is it what? Is it common among others? And I assume she means is it common for people with DM, yep. but well, no, it can be it can be a sign of um, one-sided weakness in the pharynx. So um, typically, in people who have weakness in one side more than the other, we tell them to actually, as a treatment, turn their head toward the weak side, so that you let the strong side participate more. So if you, you know, turned your head to the weak side, you might have a more difficult time protecting the airway. And I don't know if this person's been told to do that or just noticed that on her own, but um, sometimes we, we do confirm in the modified barium swallow study whether or not head turn to one side or the other is and a facilitatory, uh, you know, maneuver to protect the airway. Sometimes it is. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gora. That's um, all right. I'm I'm looking forward to going through the recorded session because you you had a lot of good advice and a lot of information, which um, for me I can't digest all in one one time. But so to speak, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I.
like to promote our next webinar, Disclosing and Talking About Your Disorder. That will be on Wednesday, September 25th at 5 p.m. To register for this webinar, you can visit the MDF website. You have to register for each individual webinar. Um, just because you participate in this one doesn't automatically have you registered for the next ones. Some of you asked questions that may have gone um, a little on a tangent or uh, we just didn't have time for. So I invite you to make use of our warm line. I have the uh, web page up there. Uh, you go to that page and you can fill out a warm line request. So that is something that's always available on the MDF website. 